the book of Psalms, uh, we'll start in Psalm, we're just going to read Psalm 1, we're going to read the whole Psalm and uh, see what the Lord has for us. It says, and this is obviously a very, very familiar passage of Scripture, uh, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the day of judgment, or in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Uh, this, as I said a minute ago, is, is probably one of the most famous portions of Scripture in the Psalms. Um, and I do love the Psalms. Uh, I enjoy this portion of Scripture. Psalms, I've always felt like, is like town grill to me. Uh, I don't go there often, but when I go there, I always leave thinking I should do this more often. And that's, 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 that's how I feel about the Psalms. Every time I go to the Psalms, I think, man, I should just, I should just live here. I mean, I should eat here every meal uh, because there is so much truth. There is so much to get from this wonderful book. And I wanted to start looking at this Psalm tonight uh, because it is, pro it is probably, I believe, the most important Psalm of the Psalms. And it starts off, the book of Psalms, with this word, blessed. Uh, and, and Christians, and, and even Jews, obviously, for thousands of years have been blessed by the book of Psalms. And this first psalm begins by drawing a stark contrast. And if, and if you were to ask me, this is probably one of the most evangelistic psalms that there is. I can't think of another psalm that is more evangelistic than this psalm, which is why I believe God put it right here at the front. Uh, and, and the book of Psalms is obviously the Hebrew hymn book. It is the song book of praise. And, and in order to enter this song book of praise, you have to go through this evangelistic psalm. Uh, you cannot praise the Lord unless you're saved. Amen? You cannot praise Jesus unless you've been born again because our flesh cannot do that. Our flesh does not have the capacity to praise God. And so, because whatsoever is not of faith is sin, right? Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And so you have to go through Psalm 1, get born again, and then enter into this song book of praise and worship uh, as you would, would want to do. And so Psalm 1 is known for drawing a very stark contrast between two people. And essentially we're going to look at this tonight. We're going to look at two people, two paths, and two places. That is what the book of Psalms is about. It, it is very simple to interpret. It is not hard to understand. I'm not going to say anything tonight that you've not already heard, uh, but it is the truth of God that bears repeating. So the book of Psalms, Psalm 1, it tells us about two individuals. And you and I often see the world in this binary. We see it through this binary. Uh, we see rich and poor, as we've talked about already today. We see male and female. We see black and white. Uh, we see people who are educated and those who are uneducated. Uh, our country is divided up into Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals and, and all of this. And, and so we see the world oftentimes in these two, uh, with these two choices. You're either A or B. That's a binary. You have two choices. In this psalm, we find the only binary that matters to God. It, 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 is, it is the only A or B that God cares about. And it is those who are saved and those who are not saved. And just as much as you would fit in any other binary, every person who has ever lived or ever walked the face of this earth falls into the, one of these two categories. You are either blessed, you are either saved, that's one category, or you are this ungodly man, you are lost. And it's important that you know which category you fall in. And it breaks down very simply. Verse 1 through 3, he talks about that blessed man and who he is and what he enjoys. And then it talks about that, that, that cursed man and who he is and the path that he's on and ultimately the end that he will meet 
because of his unbelief. And I'd just like to start off and say I'm thankful that I've been born again. I'm thankful that I've been saved. And so now when I read this psalm, I see a, a beautiful psalm. I could not think of another psalm that would be more encouraging for the child of God than this one. It tells us the story of our life. It tells us what you are, who you are in Christ, and what you have to look forward to because of your position in Christ. Two people, two paths, and two places. Let's start in verse number 1 through 3. We're going to look at this blessed man. And the first thing I want to point, four things about the blessed man. The first of all, he is satisfied. He is satisfied. It says blessed, simply blessed is the man. That word blessed, it means, and I love this definition, it means to be made supernaturally joyous. It is to be made happy, to have a, a, a joy and a happiness in your life. And he's saying that a person who is born again and who is saved by the grace of God is a satisfied person. Listen, since I got saved, I've not had to look to the world for satisfaction anymore. I found it in Jesus Christ. I found everything that I never need in Him, and I still do today. I draw from the wells of salvation, and I enjoy the things of God, and it's because I've been blessed, because I've been saved. Y'all know where my favorite verses in the Bible is, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and talks about God, God blessing us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The blessed man finds ultimate joy in salvation so enriching that he can pity those who are rich in this world, but they're poor in the next. And that's a whole lot of people. Listen, a lot of the people who are envied by this world fill in the blank. Whatever celebrity, whatever politician, whatever athlete that people would say, I would love to be like her or I'd love to be like him. I'd love to be able to sing like that. I'd love to be able to act like that. I'd love to be able to, to have this big of a house and all of that. The things that people envy in this world, and they may have riches in this world, but most of them are poor in the next world. I'd rather be rich in the world to come. Amen? I, I would rather have something that's eternal, something that's everlasting, and not a temporal blessing in this life, supposed blessing in this life. And most of the things that you and I would look at and say that is a blessing. People look at folks with a lot of money and, and big houses, celebrities and all that kind of folk, and most of them who mock and ridicule the Word of God, we look at their life and we say, wow, they live such a blessed life. Do they really? Do they really? Why, why are most all of them strung out on drugs? Why are most all of them alcoholics? Why are most all of them on their fifth marriage? Why, why, why are most all of them, a lot of them committing suicide and they're depressed and they're anxious and they don't have any peace? Why? It's because the things that you think will satisfy you are not going to satisfy you. It's Jesus Christ who satisfies. And since I found Him, I found ultimate satisfaction. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, verse number 8, Whom uh, having not seen ye love, in whom though now you see Him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. This man, the blessed man, is satisfied. And if you're born again, that's you. And you can say amen to that because you know every word I just said is true and you know it in your soul. You didn't need me to tell you that. You already knew that you found satisfaction in Jesus Christ and you found everything that you would ever need. And the blessed man is a satisfied man. Secondly, he's a separated man. Look in verse number one again. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He's a separated man. There's three things that he tells us that a blessed man will not do. And something that's always interested me about this psalm is that before it even tells you what the blessed man is or what the blessed man does, he tells you what the blessed man does not do. What it's saying is that a saved person will be set apart by what he is not just as much as he'll be set apart for what he is. He's separated. There are some things that the blessed man is just not going to do. He set up some boundaries 
He has some standards. He has some convictions in his life. And they govern what he does. And he say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that because I love Jesus and I'm born again. And that is outside of the realm of Christian living. And I'm not going to do those things. This blessed man lives a distinctive life. And it sets him apart from everybody else. And you and I who are saved, we're that distinctive person. And we go out into a world of those who are sinners, those who are lost, those who do not love Jesus and do not obey the word of God, and you and I, we stand out to them. We should. Amen. I'm assuming you do. If you're saved, this verse says the blessed man does that. He is separated. There are some things that he's just not going to do. First of all, he is not going to seek their advice. He says in verse number 1 that he walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That word counsel, it just means advice or instruction. The blessed man doesn't get his orders from the world. He's not listening to them, hearing what they have to say, and then following that. You and I have another source of wisdom that we follow, don't we? We've got the Word of God. Uh, We have eternal truth in the Bible, and this is what we pattern our life after. This is where we go when we need advice and when we need instruction. We look to this book, and it tells us what we're supposed to do. We don't have to listen to the world and to their advice. You know what the world would advise you? The the, the world system is, is secular humanism. That's what it is. If it feels good, do it. Isn't that right? Just follow your heart. Whatever makes you happy. It's indulging your own flesh. Whatever your desires are, they're good and they are right. Is that not the month that they're celebrating right now with Pride Month and everything? It's whatever whatever your lusts are, they're right. They're just. And and, and how dare anybody tell you that what you're doing is not right? Because if you have this desire for it, it must be a natural desire and it must be right and you are going against your true self to not fulfill your own lustful desires. You know what that is? That's what they're telling them down at the schoolhouse. That's what they're telling them on the Disney Channel. That's what society and entertainment, that's what they're telling our kids. You just need to find yourself, just sow your wild oats, all this kind of garbage. And that's the world's advice. That's their counsel. It says the blessed man, he doesn't walk after their counsel. He's not interested in their counsel. He's not, he's not turning on Dr. Phil and Oprah Winfrey and The View to fight. God help you if it's The View. I sure hope not. But if, if, if you're turning to the world and listening to the ones that they've elevated as these gurus and people who are to instruct you, if you're looking to them for wisdom, you're not a blessed man. It says the blessed man doesn't walk after their counsel, doesn't do what they say, follows the word of God. Amen? Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, and the ends thereof are the ways of death. Charles Spurgeon said that this blessed man, he, see, he takes wiser counsel. He walks in the commandments of the Lord his God. To him the ways of piety are paths of peace and pleasantness. His footsteps are ordered by the word of God and not, to be, and not by the cunning and wicked devices of carnal men. What we have today is a lot of people who are hearing the counsel of the ungodly and they're walking in it because of the peer pressure of the world. And again, that I've said before, that's not just for kids. That's for everybody. Peer pressure. I think about a wonderful illustration of that would be in 2 Samuel chapter 13 with Amnon. I'm sure most of y'all know that Bible story, right? Amnon is the son of David who has lust toward his sister Tamar. And the Bible says that he wasn't going to do anything toward her because she was his sister, but Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab. And, Am- and Jonadab tells 
uh, tells Amnon how that he, he lays out this ploy and this plot uh, to, to, to do what he did in that chapter. And he ended up losing his life. Why? Because he had a friend. John and Dad wasn't much of a friend if you ask me. And listen to me, young people, if you've got friends that are telling you to go contrary to your parents, contrary to the Word of God, contrary to what you've been learning in Sunday school, they're not a friend. That's not a friend. A friend points you to the Word of God, right? The Bible does say the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You need a good friend who will say, hey, brother, I, I've been, I, I don't know what's going on in your life, but the Bible says this. That's a friend. A friend is somebody who will look you in the face and tell you that you're wrong. That's a friend. Tell you what the Bible says. Tell you to heed wise counsel, not the counsel of the wicked, the ungodly. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5, it tells us how we are supposed to find our counsel. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. He won't seek their advice. Secondly, he won't follow their actions. The next part of verse number 1 says, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Now as we read through these, and again, I'm sure you've heard this, and you, you know what these, uh, you've seen this progression but there is a progression that takes place between walking uh, first, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, and then stand in the way of sinners, and then eventually you find him sitting in the seat of a scornful. There is a progression that takes place. What Satan wants to do is he wants to destroy your walk with God. And so he'll throw some flashy object out there to catch your attention and to catch your eye, get you looking at that, and first you're walking, and then, and then, you, then you stop. And then eventually you're convinced that this is the place I want to be, and then you sit there. We need to be careful about that. Amen? Ever heard of a slippery slope? That's what sin is. It's a slippery slope, and it wants to devour you, and that's what Satan wants to do. But this man, he's not going to follow the actions. He's not going to do what sinners do. And notice he's not just in the way of sinners. And I want to make this application. I believe that a saved person at times in their life can find their self in the way of sinners. I believe that. I believe you can get backslid. I do believe that's a scriptural uh, principle. I believe it's in the Word of God. And I know that by experience because I've done that. You can get out in the world, but listen to me now, you won't stay there. You won't stay there. This thing, it, this verse says, standeth in the way of sinners. That ETH means a continuous action. This means it is characteristic of his life. This verse says that it will not be characteristic of the life of a blessed man to be in the way of sinners. I believe that's what this verse is saying. So there have been days where I found myself out there, but listen, I don't stay there long. Listen, God disciplines me, uh, He chastens His children, he, he scourges every son whom He receiveth, and He'll bring me back to Him, and I thank God that He does. He won't leave me out there. He'll convict me, and He'll draw me, and listen, if you kick against the pricks of conviction as a child of God, I believe you could exit this world early if you don't obey God. So we need to take this seriously, amen? The child of God is not going to have a life that is characteristic of sin. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 14 says, But be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Remember, we're talking about the blessed man being a separated man. There's something different about him. Listen, you know why I like coming to church so much? Because there's something different about y'all. Praise the Lord. There's something different about y'all. 
I, I walk in the door and I, I, I see everybody come through and I shake their hand and hug their neck and it's just something different than it is with the world because you and I have a spirit that bears witness that we're both the children of God. And we enjoy sweet fellowship and that's what's wonderful about coming to church is that we're on, this, we're on the path of this blessed man. And so you and me both are not heeding their counsel and we're not standing in the way of sinners. We're trying to walk another path. Amen? We're, we're, we're trying to tr travel a road that's less traveled by, if you will. We're trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're doing that together. And a child of God, please listen to me now, a child of God will not be comfortable in the way of sinners. So he won't standeth there. I think about Lot as an illustration of that. Lot was not comfortable in Sodom. The New Testament tells us that. Lot, Lot was a saved man who was not right with God and he's dwelling down there in Sodom. But the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 2 verse number 7 that God delivered just Lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. I don't think you could be any more in the way of sinners than Lot was. But he wasn't happy about it. Amen? The Bible says that it vexed his righteous soul. He was bothered because of the sin in, in his life and around him. And if, it, if you're not bothered by sin in that way, you have never been saved. You're not a blessed man. That's one way that I know that I'm saved. Because when I sin, it bothers me. It bothers me. And I need to get right. And I have to ask God to forgive me. I can't just go on that way. This blessed man, he's, he's separated. He will not take their advice. He won't follow their actions. Thirdly, he will not adopt their attitudes. Look in verse number, three, verse number one, the last part of that verse. He says, Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. It is saying that he, a scorner, would be one that mocks the things of God. Matthew Henry said that a scorner is someone who is not just ungodly, and he's not just rebellious, but he mocks that which he rebels against. That's a scorner. You ever been mocked for being a Christian? I, I sure have. Get mocked for it, ridiculed and scorned and, and looked down on. You know what that is? That's pride. And that's not characteristic of a Christian. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 34, Surely he that scorneth, surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. It's talking about God. It says that God, if you're a scorner, God's going to scorn you. But he gives grace to those that are lowly. It is a pride humility thing. If you're, if you're born again, you, you have a level of humility about you. You have to because you cannot be saved any other way. Amen. In order to be saved, you have to bow your knee to God. You have to confess Him, Lord. You have to admit that you can't. You have to call out to Him for salvation. That takes humility. Jesus said you got to come as a little child, right? So everybody that gets saved has a level of humility about them because they've confessed Christ Lord. They've seen their own sinfulness. They know they deserve to go to hell, but they find salvation in Jesus Christ. So you're not going to be a scorner if that's happened to you. Those who mock and who ridicule you and I for loving Jesus and, and trying to obey the Bible, they, they, they are going to be scorned one of these days by God. The Bible says... In the book of Proverbs, it says that God, he, he, will, he will laugh when their fear comes. He said when calamity comes upon them, he says he's going to laugh. Look who's scorning now. Amen? That, that, that's what the Word of God says. So you and I who are saved, the blessed man, we're separated from the world in these areas. We don't follow their advice and their actions or their attitudes. So, uh, let's look thirdly. The blessed man, he is satisfied and he's separated. Thirdly, he is saturated. Look in verse number 2. The Bible says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. The blessed man literally saturates himself 
with the Word of God. And it says that he delights in the law of the Lord. It, it makes him happy. It's a, it is a source of joy for him, the Word of God. That word means to take pleasure in. Listen, I take pleasure in this Bible. And before I got saved, I, I didn't take pleasure in the Bible. I was drugged to church as a kid, and I remember just sitting around thinking, when, when is he going to be done? Can we just move on? What's the next thing? The Bible didn't, re- it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't really real to me in my heart. I didn't take pleasure in it the way I do now. I love this Bible. Amen? I hope you love your Bible. If you're saved by the grace of God, you should love your Bible. There's something in your soul that when you hear the Word of God, it just does something for you. It gives you some kind of a peace that just overwhelms your soul. The Spirit of God bears witness with you and lets you know that's the truth of God because the Spirit said that He'll guide us into all truth. And every time a child of God opens the Word of God, the Spirit of God, it, it ministers to him. That's what, listen, that's what's happening tonight if you're saved. If you're, if you're saved by the grace of God and you're not asleep, this Bible ministers to you. And you hear the truth of God and something inside of you wells up and says amen to that. Whether it comes out of your mouth or not, it's in your spirit if you're saved. Right? Because, because the Holy Ghost bears witness with the Word of God and it just brings a delight to you. The longest psalm, I'm sure all of y'all know, is Psalm 119. 119. The entire Psalm, Psalm 119, is about the Bible. I believe there are one, maybe two, verses in Psalm 119 that do not have a direct reference to the Bible in each ver- in the verse itself. It will use the word precepts, statutes, commandments, the law, what testimonies, whatever, all these different synonyms for the Bible. And every one of those verses in Psalm 119. And that's the theme, obviously, of Psalm 119 is the Bible. And in Psalm 119, you find the word delight nine times. It's telling you over and over and over and over again that if you're a child of God, you'll delight in the law of God. You love the Bible. Amen. That is your pleasure. Listen, I'm thankful I don't have to find pleasure in sinful things, but I can find pleasure in sacred things. This Bible is inspired. It is the Word of God. It is inerrant. It is something you can believe and you can trust. Listen, it's the only thing that you can hold in your hands that is in heaven right now. The Bible says the Word of God is settled forever in heaven. We've got a book that came from heaven. We should delight in it, and we do delight in it if we're saved. It is not only His pleasure, it is also, uh, we see His pondering. It goes on to say in verse number 2, And in His law doth He meditate day and night. That Hebrew word for meditate, uh, it, it literally means to murmur to yourself. It's, it's, it's like it's, it's saying you, you repeat it over and over. You ponder it by talking to oneself. That's the idea behind this word to meditate. Brother Jarvis in Bible college said that meditation is getting the goody out of it. That's what he called it. He says you're, if you're meditating on something, that means you're getting the goody out of it. Listen, if you read a verse, y'all believe this Bible's inexhaustible? Do you? I believe that. I believe this Bible's inexhaustible. I think it's good if, if even say, well, I don't have time to read 10 chapters a day or whatever. If you just tried to read a verse and you tried to just memorize that verse, one verse a day. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this, I'm going to read this verse, and I'm going to meditate on it and think about it throughout the day. I don't know how many words are in that verse, but you'll get a whole lot more out of it than you think you would, even the shortest verses. If you meditate on it, you let the Spirit of God minister to you and apply that truth to your heart, it'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger the more time you spend with it. That's why we can, and, and, and preachers often do, we'll, we'll take one verse of Scripture and it's something that we've been praying over and looking over and studying on and meditating on and get up and preach a whole message on one verse. Why? Because it might have just been one verse, but it's a big old book. And there's a whole lot of truth that can be packed in one verse of Scripture. 
if you'll take the time to get the goody out of it and meditate on it and think about it, not just pass on by. Just like a cow chews the cud, you and I, the blessed man, we can read the Word of God and we can chew the cud. We can think about it and meditate and, and God will feed us by doing so. And listen, I think that would be a whole lot better thing to think about than most of the things that people think about. And most of what occupies our minds. And I know I preached on the mind the last uh, couple of Wednesday nights, and so I'm not going to go back through and re-preach that. But the Bible does say, Proverbs 23, verse number 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And if you and I are going to have the joy of the Lord, and we're going to be filled with the knowledge of his will, we're going to need to be filled with the word of God. Listen, do not tell me that God has not talked to you if your Bible is closed. Don't tell me, well, I'm waiting on a word from God. You looking for airplanes? Was you laying out in a field and looking at the clouds? And That one looks like a T. You're trying to, trying to spell something out. God gave you a book. A lot of letters in it. They're already there. Amen? And this is for you. And God wants to talk to you out of His Word. And for the child of God, uh, he, he not only delights in the law of God, but, and, and He takes pleasure in it, but He ponders it. He, he thinks about it. And thinking on this Bible will give you joy. Amen? It'll, it'll keep you going. And listen, I thank God that I'm saved and that I'm the blessed man. And one of these days, Lord willing, maybe next week we'll come back and look at, the, at, this, at this other man. But I'm just thankful that I'm saved today. Listen, I'm thankful that, I, that I'm satisfied with Jesus Christ. Aren't you? I'm thankful that I'm satisfied with Him. I'm thankful that God has allowed me to be separated by the Spirit of God. And listen, I can't do that on my own. The Holy Ghost of God has to do that in us. You cannot mortify the deeds of your flesh. You cannot do it. You need the Spirit of God to do it. And so the blessed man is, is exuding all the symptoms of the Spirit of God working in him and through him. And I'm, I thank God that it's that way. And I thank God for my Bible. I want to read it more. I want to love it more. I do pleasure in it. But listen, I could pleasure in it. I could take more pleasure in it than I do. I think we all could. Let's ask for God to help us to be the blessed men, the blessed ladies that God's called for us to be. Amen.